We have, uh, I see three participants. Oh, that's us. So I'm going to broadcast oh. Oh, now oh, and I then see. the attendees will okay. hopefully flood in. Right. Okay. And we'll just give them a minute. So we're now live. Hopefully a few people are waiting. Oh, there we go. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. We're gonna start in just a minute. Okay, um, I think we're ready to get started. Are you ready? Um, let me just give me one second here. Sure, sure. We have a few more people coming in. Um, maybe if I, how did, does that look a little better? <laughs> Background or the same? You look, you look great. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. perfect. That's okay. perfect. All right. um, yes, and uh, so everyone, um, Welcome. We're gonna uh, you're gonna be able to ask questions at the end. So I'll just give a little uh, <clears throat> lay of the land. Welcome. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm the adult programs one of the adult programs coordinators at the Athenaeum, and thank you for being here virtually. And so at the bottom of your screen, you'll see three options. You should see Q and A, chat, um, and raise your hand. So. Uh, Bill, who I'll introduce in a moment, is going to be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we're going to have time for Q&A. So the way you can submit your qu questions is to hit on Q&A and type them in, and I will um, read them and we'll get those answered. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Today we have William McKeever. He is an author, filmmaker, and ocean, shark, ocean and shark enthusiast. He has traveled the world documenting his journeys. He has worked tirelessly to bring the issues of ocean and shark conservation to the forefront through education and activism. His book, Emperors of the Deep, is now available in paperback at Mitchell's and uh, Nantucket Bookworks. And we're going to put the link to that to purchase the book. And you can pick it up curbs curbside or have it shipped. We'll put that in chat for you. Um, and he's also the producer and director of a documentary of the same name, Emperors of the Deep. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to William McKeever. Great. Thank you, Janet. And um, welcome, everyone. And uh, wonderful to be with you uh, Friday evening. Here we are, middle of uh, June, and uh, summer is upon us. And this is a time we go to the beach, and sharks are on many people's minds. And so uh, what I'd like to do this evening is talk about uh, sharks in, in a different light than, than what we're used to. Uh, take a look at the real hard facts and also take a look at the recent discoveries that have, that have taken place over the last uh, several years. And I've 
put this in a documentary film as well as in a, a paperback book that just came out by HarperCollins. And so tonight you're going to see the highlights of, uh, of the film. Um, it's not out yet. It will be on uh, Google Play and Apple iTunes uh, starting in uh, July. But you're going to see a sneak preview of uh, some of the highlights. So this is me. And um, I started out uh, actually after I saw Jaws, very much influenced by the movie. And uh, I would go in the ocean and I would think uh, a little bit about, well, maybe there's a shark out there and I have to be worried about it. And uh, after I started to study sharks, I came to the opposite conclusion, as you can see here, very comfortable swimming with sharks. And what I'd like to do tonight is tell you a little bit about my story, and then we'll talk about discoveries, uh, and then ocean warming, which is a, a relatively new discovery that we've learned about sharks. And then what I think is maybe the meat of all this is that sharks are really crucial to the marine ecosystem. Uh, we need sharks. And when you see lots of sharks, that's a very good thing. That means that the oceans are healthy. So anyway, this is a, a video of a shark tournament. I went undercover. And this is what got me started on my journey when I stumbled on a shark tournament in Montauk. This is a Mako shark only tournament. This apex predator can grow to over a thousand pounds, and yet it can sprint 45 miles an hour. Anglers like to catch makos, which fight hard, and they can leave 20 to 30 feet in the air. This is no sporting game for the shark. He is in a desperate fight for his life. Right down this. Yeah. The shark is hooked, and now the life and death struggle begins. Powerful engines with thousands of horsepower take on sharks weighing as little as 125 pounds. The battles can last one to two hours. As you can see, these sharks, they're brought in uh, and they're weighed, and they just want to catch the heaviest shark that they can. Uh, this shark was a mako, it was caught, and it just didn't weigh enough, so it was disqualified. And that shark ended up going into the garbage. So you can see all these people uh, surrounding it, gawking. The shark weighs only 120 pounds, too small to qualify for the tournament and too young to breed. It's really a, a tragedy, and, and that's a mako shark. And I do want to uh, point out that uh, that is a, a shark that is classified right now as endangered. So uh, this is something that I'm on a mission now, is to put an end to these shark tournaments. And I have a chapter in the book about them um, and why we need to uh, rethink them. 
And uh, after I saw that shark tournament and I wanted to do something to stop them, uh, I decided that I needed to really understand what was going on with sharks. And fortunately, we're living in an era now where in the last few years, scientists have learned a tremendous amount of information about sharks. And uh, as an example, this is a, a thresher shark. And this shark, um, as you'll see here, has a very unique feature. You can see its tail. Now, this is typically a, a 10 or 12 foot long shark. Its tail is just as long as its body. And what it does is it hurls itself into a, a bait ball and then whips its tail and uses that percussion to kill the fish. And it, sometimes the tail will actually hit the fish and it will come back and eat the fish at its leisure. Really didn't know what that tail was for, but now we know. Uh, you can see how beautiful, how graceful this shark is. And um, I just want to show again with the tail. You can see he drives his head down and brings the tail into it. There is no animal that on the planet that hunts with their tail. Sharks are so unique and uh, remarkable. This is a uh, obviously a, a, a hammerhead. Scientists have learned a lot about them, and they wondered for a long time what it was about their head that made them develop the eyes perched on the edge. And they determined that sharks, hammerhead sharks, have 360 degree vision. So it gives them an amazing perspective. And there's a lot of equipment crammed into that head. So they actually can detect electrical fields of prey buried in the sand. And by having the nostrils spread across the, the, the head, that gives them the opportunity to detect uh, the odor plume and that gives them an ability to zero in on prey that might be as much as a mile away. So they can really are great trackers. Um, this shark obviously has a uh, good sized dorsal fin. This is typically three feet. And in fact, it gives the shark uh, an extra way of, of extra oomph going, going through the, the water because that uh, fin gives it extra lift. And so hammerhead sharks have now been seen swimming on their sides so that they get an additional 10% efficiency when they're swimming. So again, they're uh, just amazing over, the, over their 20 million year history that hammerheads have been around, uh, these capabilities uh, developed. Uh, this looks like a, a Halloween costume. This is actually uh, a shot looking up uh, of the new species of sharks that was discovered in Indonesia. And this is uh, an Indonesian sawtooth shark. And uh, the, this species was never known before, literally within the last uh, month. And we continue to find new species. I remember when I was doing some research, I uh, came across a book uh, that was about oh, 20, 30 years old. And at the time they said there are 200 species of sharks. Well, now we know there are over 500 species of sharks. So I suspect we're gonna continue to find some more. Uh, this is one that uh, was one of my favorites. This is called an epaulette shark. And as you can see here, it is out of the water. And what they do is at, at low tide, they come out and literally walk on the reef. And they're looking for crabs and muscles and, and that sort of thing. And they figured out a way that they can get enough oxygen uh, to do this. Tide comes back in and they go back uh, underwater. So this epaulette shark is again, another discovery. Uh, we've also learned a lot about the big sharks, uh, the great white sharks that everybody is familiar with. And they are remarkably similar to people. Uh, they have a gestation period, much like uh, us, actually a little bit longer. And when they do have pups, uh, they don't have very many like us, uh, usually only two. And uh, recently, scientists have been able to determine what juvenile great white sharks eat, and um, it's fish. They eat, um, in the, this Australian study, uh, they go after uh, Australian salmon, and uh, they eat uh, bait fish, menhaden, that, that sort of thing. It's really the only kind of uh, 
food that they can find at that age. And of course, they don't have a mother around them to teach them. And then when they get to be teenagers and around 20 years old, they get to be big enough that they can go after marine mammals like seals. And uh, it takes them a long time to actually become sexually mature. They're like people. Uh, they won't breed before they're 20 or 25 years of age. And of course, given it takes that long for them to develop, they can live like us to be about 75 years of age. And uh, here's a, a shot of a, of a great white hunting a seal. The seal, the great white shark's favorite meal. You, you can see that um, the shark um, was able to, to capture that seal. Usually, um, great whites uh, have a difficult time catching adult seals. They typically prey on the young uh, who aren't as agile. And uh, so as a great white shark, it's a real challenge to, uh, to catch these seals. And of course, in Martha's Vineyard, Monomoy Island on the Cape, the seals are making a comeback. And the Marine Mammal Protection Act has brought their populations back to over 300,000. And so the sharks are coming in. Now, that's a good thing because what happens is the seals left to their own devices will continue to reproduce and eat all the, the fish that would ordinarily go to commercial fisheries or for recreational fishing. So we actually need the sharks to control the seal population. This is a picture of uh, a couple of great whites. It was taken in New Zealand. And I'm bringing uh, this picture up because one of the things that's been an old myth about great whites is they're solitary animals, they're cold-blooded, they're killers, and they're actually uh, social. Um, these are known as the brothers. They, they travel together in New Zealand. Uh, the photographer of this uh, also has other photos of as many as four or five great whites traveling together and hunting together, sharing uh, seals. And uh, when and they take turns feeding, and when they they are ready for their turn, they'll slap their tail on the water, saying, "All right, it's my turn." And and so they have a real communication that goes on. Uh, this is again highly unusual because that's that great white on the upper part of the picture has totally exposed his underbelly to the shark beneath him. Obviously, he feels very comfortable. So again, we're, we're finding new things about animals. And I go into the book about lemon sharks in the Bahamas and how they actually develop friendships. And scientists have noted that they uh, develop partnerships and that will last for actually a, a couple of years. Now, I do want to get uh, the issue of shark attacks out of the way. Uh, it obviously is big in the, in the minds of the media. And the first thing they'll say on Shark Week or in the media is that shark attacks are up. And I have to say that's absolutely correct. And this uh, graph going back to 1900, every decade, there's been an increase. Now, the reason is very simple. That is the human population continues to grow, income is increasing. And so people have the time, the leisure to go to the beach and they have the opportunity as they're swimming to encounter a shark. And uh, that's when sometimes there can be uh, mistakes. Now, this is a, a picture of a bull shark. And I mention this because in the tagging studies, we now see, know that tiger sharks swim uh, and bull sharks and great white sharks swim right up to the beach. Um, and it's not anything nefarious. It's just they're making a living uh, swimming in the shallows, and they're looking for their various prey items. Now, it's not unusual to run into a human. Uh, the water is very clear here, so the uh, possibility of a mistake is, is very low. But in other cases where you get uh, some cloudy water, there can be a mistake. 
Now, uh, these three are the ones that are typically uh, implicated in a, uh, in a shark attack. Most of the 500 species of sharks are actually quite small. Uh, most of them, like cat sharks, are only two or three feet in length. So these are really the only ones that uh, we have to worry about. And I, I do want to mention that uh, when, when there is a, an encounter and people have an experience like that, um, they actually have a very interesting response. So listen to this person who was attacked by a great white shark in South Africa. The country of South Africa has the third highest number of shark attacks in the world, many of them by great whites. My name's Joseph Kroner. I'm from Mossel Bay, South Africa. I've surfed most of my life since I was five years old. Um, and I was attacked by a shark, great white. I had been surfing for a while, had a few waves and I was busy paddling. And I was halfway up and just decided to have a rest. So I, I put both my arms up on the board and was just sort of lying, lying flat on the board. Well, that's when it happened. And it came from behind. So I just slowly felt myself lifting up. Um, and then my mind sort of blanks out. I remember when I came up, out the water, I looked straight at it swimming away from me. And that was probably the most hectic part, just to see the intensity of the animal and just sort of white water. And the board, I could see the board sticking out on either side. So at that stage it was probably broken because it was sticking out at an angle. Out of the shark's mouth? Out of its mouth, yeah. So this is the piece that the great white bit out of my surfboard. Um, you can obviously see the shape of its mouth and you can get an indication of the size. I think they would have worked out the size at three and a half meters just from the sort of the size of the bite. Yeah, you can have a look. So the, the teeth marks are here. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty sharp. I see sharks as sort of beautiful animals. I've only got more respect for them because of the attack. They're very graceful and mostly peaceful. So I see them with a lot of respect and, and awe, so. And I, I really think his experience is, is telling because um, here's someone who uh, obviously survived the attack. He, uh, all 10 fingers and, and, and 10 toes. If the shark had really been interested in him, uh, I would have not had this interview. And uh, it was a surfboard that looked like a prey item that got the great white's attention. Now, sometimes uh, there are mistakes made uh, and there are damages, but when you consider that uh, it's very, it's still very rare for these kind of incidents to happen, uh, shows that the sharks are not intentionally uh, going after us. And I think his uh, view of, of sharks actually changed for the better as a result of what happened to him. Um, so let me review very quickly the uh, attacks, or as I call them, bites for the last uh, year of the data, 2019. You can see the United States is uh, the country by far with uh, the most shark attacks. Australia is a distant uh, second, and then you get in the Bahamas, and then from there it, it really trickles off. Uh, Florida is uh, the number one state for attacks. Uh, followed by Hawaii and then uh, California. Uh, so Florida is a percent of the worldwide attacks is actually um, just about half of all attacks around uh, the world. And uh, when the international shark attack file looked at what were the activities people were doing when there was uh, an attack or a bite, number one, well over half is surfing. Now, when you're a shark and you're going on the bottom, you look, you see that surfboard, that looks like a, a dugong, looks like a seal, dolphin, and so it looks like a prey item. Uh, snorkeling, scuba divers are in the water, they're easily discernible, very unusual. And actually for snorkeling, 
usually those people are spear fishing, and that creates uh, activity that interests the shark when they're fish that are being speared and, and, and that sort of thing. So it's a case of mistaken identity. Now, uh, there is something that I do want to mention because we've got Shark Week coming up and they love to talk about shark attacks and have the dramatic Jaws music playing in the background. And the reality is, is that sharks attack, uh, attacks are actually going down. This has been going on now for, uh, for three years, 2018, 19, and, and in 20. Uh, you can see last year we dropped to 41. The number of deaths around the world is a constant at around five. Uh, and I think that's actually remarkable when you consider there's seven and a half billion people on the planet uh, and people in the water all the time. And that's all the, the deaths, as tragic as they are. Uh, the United States uh, averages less than one death a year because we have very good medical care. When someone is bitten, they get immediate care. Um, uh, the number one issue is stop the bleeding. And so we've got people on beaches react very quickly, stop that bleeding, and the, and the person typically will survive because it's very rare for a shark to come back for a second bite. They realize after their first bite, they made a mistake, they usually move on. So uh, deaths are very rare in, in this country. Obviously, they do happen once in a while, but uh, in the big picture, uh, quite rare. Now, uh, the reason the shark attacks are down is due to this guy. This is a black tip shark. This is not actually an apex shark. Uh, sharks are, and some of them are known what's called meso predators, meso being middle. And this middle level uh, black tip shark uh, has a very distinct range. And in the uh, summertime, they live in North Carolina, as you can see by the arrow, they go to Florida in the wintertime all the way down to the Keys in Miami. And they hug the coast because they like to be over the continental shelf. They like to be near the, the, the bottom. And they're typically running into surfers. The surfing capital in the United States is in Smyrna Beach. Uh, and that's the number one place where there's shark attacks. And so we've, we've had most of the attacks in this area related to this shark. Now, ocean warming. Um, this has caused a change in the migration of sharks. So these black tip sharks coming down in the winter time uh, only have to go to Georgia to get to that preferred range. And scientists have discovered that sharks, each species has a preferred temperature range. And in the case of the black tip shark, they like it around 70 or 72 degrees, which is kind of the same temperature I like as well, uh, and many of us. And so they don't want to go any farther south. So they're not going to Miami anymore. So they're not running into surfers. So attacks are down. And conversely, in the summer months, um, they want to get into that little cooler water. So they're coming all the way up to my neck of the woods, uh, up around Long Island and uh, up not too far from the Cape. Now, that's a stressor for these sharks because they have to travel an additional thousand miles from North Carolina up to Long Island. They have to find more food. They run the risk of being caught in long line operations. And, uh, and this is uh, something that the increase in temperature is, is a challenge for sharks. Over the last uh, 70 years, uh, ocean temperatures on average around the world have increased by two degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, there is some prediction that in the next 50 years, unless we do something, that the oceans will warm by an additional five degrees Fahrenheit, which will, of course, make these sharks and many other uh, sea life species have to migrate to find that ideal temperature that they want. So, uh, so we're, we're seeing that drop off in, uh, in attacks. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I think we're just, as a species uh, need to accept the fact that we go in the water, that's uh, a wilderness area, that's where the shark lives, and we have to adjust ourselves uh, so that we can coexist with sharks. They're gonna be around, we want them around. So let's look at, on the right-hand side of this slide, things that we can do. Australia uses drones, uh, that's been uh, working. There was actually a, a great drone shot of two surfers uh, out in the water, and there were two great white sharks underneath them. The, the white sharks weren't interested in them. Uh, they could clearly make them out, and they called the surfers out of the water. So drones work. 
in South Africa, they use shark spotters, which are people on a hillside looking out with binoculars for sharks, get people out of the water when a shark comes in. Uh, that's been very effective in, in South Africa. Um, then there was a uh, inventive uh, person who came up with a sea snake wetsuit. And sea snakes are poisonous. Sharks stay away from them. Sea snakes have bands, alternating dark and white bands. And so he designed the wetsuit uh, to look like a sea snake. Uh, seems to be working so far. Uh, and, and I think that's the sort of thing we need. Uh, drum lines, culling, nets to catch and kill sharks. They don't work. Sharks are migratory. They're constantly on the move. So the, a shark that may have done something has moved on and another shark, totally innocent, has moved in doesn't make any sense uh, to kill them. And one last thing I wanna mention very quickly on the left-hand side, Australia did a study about tiger sharks and how to predict when tiger sharks might attack. And they actually found an increase in rain led to attacks. So the reason is very simple. The rain comes down, uh, collects sediment in, in creeks, that, uh, that sediment flows into rivers and into the ocean and disturbs the clarity. So when the ocean is more turbid, that's when the tiger sharks were making mistakes. So uh, the, uh, the, the message Australia is giving out when it's raining, uh, you may, may want to wait a day for that water to clear up. Now, uh, sharks are incredibly uh, crucial as apex predators, as keystone species to the marine ecosystem. The best analogy is to look at uh, wolves uh, on land. And any of you may be familiar when they took wolves out of Yellowstone, the trophic cascade, or in other words, the impact on the ecosystem that it had. It was a disaster. Uh, the river started to meander, species started to decline. They brought the, the wolves back and uh, that had an immediate impact on Yellowstone. The rivers flowed straighter. Certain populations of animals like beaver came back. That same analogy applies to the ocean. When you keep an apex predator uh, healthy, it helps the system. And here's a uh, discussion with a scientist about tiger sharks and seagrass. So we've been working on tiger sharks in a seagrass ecosystem of Western Australia that looks a lot like seagrass should have all around the world maybe centuries ago before people started affecting these systems. And what we've been trying to figure out is what would happen if we lost tiger sharks. Why we want to know this is that seagrasses are really important for lots of reasons. First and foremost, they provide food and habitat for small fish, shrimps, crabs that grow up to be important in food webs, but are also species that people want to catch and eat. And so we need to make sure we're protecting seagrass ecosystems for that reason. But it also turns out that they're important for climate change because they store a lot of carbon dioxide. The seagrass pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, builds up more seagrass, and then when that seagrass dies, it gets buried. So it's kind of sequestering carbon. So if we lose seagrasses, that carbon dioxide is gonna end up in the atmosphere and may make things worse for climate change. Seagrass grows almost everywhere along the world's coastlines. So what we've done is study tiger sharks and a lot of their prey like dugongs, which are sea cows, and sea turtles. And those are the big grazers on seagrass. What we've found is that the tiger sharks change where these big grazers feed. And where it's really dangerous, there are lots of tiger sharks, those grazers spend almost no time there. And that kind of protects the seagrass. So we get these really big, dense forests of seagrass that provide great habitat and also sequester lots of carbon dioxide. Now in those areas where the sharks aren't as dangerous and the big grazers spend their time, you have very little seagrass. It looks like a really closely cropped lawn. Not a lot of carbon being buried and also not a lot of place for the little fish to hide and grow up. And so what that showed us is that the tiger sharks really are controlling not just where the big grazers are spending their time, but actually the seagrass beds themselves. So what we're seeing in this one situation is that sharks are probably critical to maintaining the health of oceans. 
When it comes to big animals like tiger sharks, there is really no other animal that can fill their role. There's no other species out there that can threaten adult sea cows. There's no other species that can you know, tear through a turtle shell so effectively and, and control their populations. Tiger sharks also consume garbage, including tires and license plates. Uh, now, uh, I could go on and, and talk about sharks and other marine ecosystems, coral reefs. Obviously, we, we don't have time, but I do go into great length in the book about the importance of shark, sharks to the marine ecosystem. So you can always uh, read up on it there. Uh, now, the, one of the things that's uh, remarkable to me, in spite of the, the how important these sharks are, sharks are facing their greatest threat than they've ever faced in their 450 million year history. And it's mainly because of this. This is long line fishing. This is a schematic. Uh, long line fishing is very simple, uh, but brutal. Uh, you can see in the upper right hand, the, the, the ship puts one line out, attaches a bunch of hooks to that line that are baited, and uh, they let that line sit. Now that line can be 100 miles long. And some people have told me they can be as long as 150 miles. So when you put a, put a line out like that, you're gonna catch a lot of things and a lot, most of it is what you don't want. Uh, these, these fishermen are actually trying to get tuna and swordfish, but tuna is really their, their target because they want to uh, create canned tuna, which is a, a big consumer item for this country. Now, what happens is uh, they catch sea turtles and uh, they also get seabirds. And we lose about 300,000 seabirds every year to long line fishing. And of course we catch sharks and uh, they could let the sharks go, but they don't want to let the sharks go, which I'm gonna explain in a minute. And uh, this video will talk about that. And uh, you can see. The crew of the Rainbow Warrior boards a fishing vessel to inspect their records. Uh, what? Oh. This logbook really didn't line up for the amount of time that it had been at sea already, which was more than two months. Uh, no, no. There's only supposed to be three sharks okay. in total. In the last freezer hold we checked, we found three sacks of shark fins more than 600 different shark fins from various different species. It'll be hacked apart, the fins chopped off and put in the hold, and the body of the shark will be dumped back overboard. And often that can still be alive at that point. And without its fin, it's simply going to die a painful and slow death in the ocean. Bottom line is that there are 100 million sharks that are killed every year, and the vast majority of that, 70 million, are for shark fin soup. Now, what's happened with the uh, COVID crisis is that many unscrupulous uh, fish traders are using COVID as a cover to ship uh, fins illegally. Just uh, two weeks ago, there was a shipment caught in Hong Kong, 27 tons of fins. Now, that's just the weight of the fins, not the body. That's 38,000 sharks. Those fins were destined to China. So the consumption of shark fin soup uh, continues and uh, it really is a travesty 
that that uh, we allow this to to happen. Um, at the same time, sharks are in this country under threat from shark tournaments. They catch endangered uh, shark species, as I mentioned, makos are endangered, um, and uh, the blue shark, which is a a, a very popular shark here, is it's classified as near threatened. Uh, those are very easily caught, and they're in, in shark tournaments. I'm not sure why they want to catch them in shark tournaments because blue sharks are scavengers, and so they'll it's incredibly easy to catch them. And of course, uh, sharks are used for products for shark meat. Uh, South Africa is a very active longline operation, and they ship shark meat to Australia for fish and chips. Now, the Australians don't know that when they're buying the fish and chips, that that's shark meat. They just fry it up and just give it another name. Uh, but that is the reality. Uh, one uh, shark product that drives me crazy is the shark cartilage pills. There was somehow a belief that spread a few years ago that sharks don't get cancer. That's false. Sharks do get cancer and eating them, eating their cartilage as a way to protect yourself from cancer is utter nonsense. So, so what can we do about this? And I think that uh, in spite of what's happening to sharks, I am optimistic. I think that we as consumers have a great deal of power. So when you buy your seafood, just make think about what you're buying and, and try to buy something that wasn't involved, uh, didn't involve catching sharks or didn't involve uh, catching a lot of fish that, that hurt the environment. So uh, canned tuna, as an example, you can buy polecat tuna, which means that's a tuna that was caught with one fisherman with one pole and no bycatch. And that polecat tuna says it right on the label. Uh, Greenpeace has a list of all the polecat tuna manufacturers that you may want to consider. And of course, um, Marine Stewardship Council has a seal of approval. You can see the blue uh, tag that they have. Uh, look for that. Um, and also when you're buying seafood, uh, you know, we're pretty good in this country with managing uh, the seafood that, that we catch. So the best thing to do is to buy American seafood that's wild. Wild salmon from Alaska is ideal uh, and from California. Um, those are the things that we should be eating, not farmed salmon, which has a lot of chemicals and additives. We shouldn't be taking and eating uh, farmed salmon that comes from countries like Norway and Chile. We should be buying instead wild shrimp caught in the Gulf of Mexico. So when we do these sorts of things, we send a message to the seafood suppliers about what we want. And then we also need legislation. It's still allow, permissible to trade in shark fins in this country. This should be banned. There is a bill sitting in Congress. And I think if enough people contact their congressman or congresswoman, senator, to get this bill passed, the better off we're going to be. And then, of course, we can all get involved in organizations that, that are working to help protect uh, sharks. Greenpeace, Oceana, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute uh, has a number of webinars, educational uh, videos that they have to keep people informed of what's going on and what they can do. So I am optimistic, but it, it involves education, people understanding what's going on with the evils of longline fishing, and then taking action and doing something uh, about it. So what you can do is uh, follow me on my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, I'm William McKeever Official. And go to my website, williammckeever.com, and sign up for my newsletter. I always try to bring in the latest news and what can be done. Uh, I'm working this summer with the American Bar Association, the ABA, and uh, we're working on a resolution that would, uh, that would say that we need to ban shark finning around the world. And I think that's an important step because then uh, we can take that resolution and, and show it to regulatory bodies around the world. And of course, I just want to mention the paperback, Emperors of the Deep, the Shark, is out, available at uh, Mitchell's. Great summer read, also makes a great Father's Day gift uh, and a birthday gift during the summer as, as well. And uh, here's the, the, uh, the, the cover of the book. So with that, um, I'm 
would love to open it up to uh, to questions. And uh, my colleague Janet is going to uh, feed me the questions. So uh, we're ready for whatever thoughts or comments you might have. Yeah, thanks, Bill. That was great. And just a reminder, if you look in the chat, everyone, there is a link to Nantucket Book Partners, um, and that is a link to the paperback. Um, or if you want the nice, shiny hardcover, they do have that in stock as well, so you can contact them. Um, okay, and then go ahead and submit your answers through uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. We do have one question. Um, this is from Kristen. And she asked, what was the most useful source in writing Emperors of the Deep? Um, the most useful source was getting out and, and talking to uh, shark scientists. And we've got a, a lot of great ones here in, in this country. Mike Heidhouse, who, as you can see, he was the one who did the study on uh, tiger sharks. He's done amazing work. Uh, there's also uh, Steve Kajura at uh, the Florida Atlantic University. Uh, uh, not far from uh, Palm Beach, who's done some amazing work on, on these uh, black tip sharks. And he actually was a, a pilot. And as he was flying around, he noticed all these little dots in the water and realized they were actually sharks. And he counted thousands of them migrating together. And that led to his, uh, his study. So, you know, we have the scientists that are getting the knowledge. And I think we you know, need to listen to them and, and uh, sign up and, and uh, use that knowledge to, uh, to help save sharks. Mm -hmm. um, so go ahead if anyone has any questions. I have a question um, <laughs> as I was watching. You mentioned that because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, they're using it as a shield to um, uh, transport shark fins and they're kind of getting away with it. What other impacts on sharks is the pandemic having globally? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a bit of a mixed bag in that uh, recently the commercial fisheries are operating in coastal areas. Obviously, they've been uh, held at shore. So that's, that's a break for the fish populations, sharks and uh, everything else. And uh, going back uh, to other periods in history where there's been a disruption, uh, back in World War I and World War II, uh, commercial fishing was virtually halted and the fish populations uh, came back. So we have that benefit going on. Uh, but sadly, um, shark tournaments are going to start up again this summer. There's, there's one in Montauk coming up in, uh, later on in, in June. And so we're, you know, we're, we're going to see those. Now, um, I think that one one thing that's that's very important that we can do for sharks and actually the oceans is humans are uh, pretty rough on uh, on fish species uh, around the world. We've taken the, the magnificent bluefin tuna right to the edge. They are now considered endangered. And what we need to do is step back and let many of these species uh, recover. And uh, I think a great idea is to set up more marine protected areas. And these are areas that uh, where there's no commercial fishing allowed and they have been set up successfully in areas and they've seen the fish populations come back. Um, there is initiative right now to put 30% of the world's oceans in marine protected areas by 2030. Uh, today, we don't do anywhere near enough of that. Only 3% of the world's oceans are in marine protected areas. I think if people uh, tell a representative that it's what we want, and, and I think we also have to use our position. We are a huge uh, consumer of seafood. We get uh, tilapia uh, from China. We get uh, uh, tuna from Europe. It's, and if we just say to these uh, regulatory bodies around the world that we need to change this whole structure mm -hmm. and to bring, some, bring uh, countries that are overfishing make them accountable and make sure we're not doing that. So marine protected areas are, are a great way to do that. Yeah. Okay, great. I have a couple more questions. Um, Catherine wants to know, what's your favorite shark and why do you like them? Uh, thank you, Catherine, for that, that question. Um, I love them all. I kind of feel like the mother who's got 12 children and says, I love them all the same. Um, and, uh, and I, but I do have some favorites. Um, the thresher shark, just because that tail 
is so magnificent. I think they are they are so graceful in the water. And the other shark that's right up there for me is the tiger shark. Um, you know, when their tigers are born, uh, their stripes are really visible. Um, and they fade as they get uh, a little bit older. But what I like about the tiger shark is they actually have a bit of a personality. Um, they are ambush predators. What that means is they move into an area and they like to hide around the reefs, uh, whereas uh, great white sharks and mako sharks are attack sharks. They will use their speed to, uh, to get their prey. Mako sharks go 45 miles an hour, equal to uh, horses in the, in the Kentucky Derby. So those tiger sharks uh, kind of sneak up on their prey. And when they get around divers, uh, they kind of play games with them. Uh, divers that I've talked to have said, they'll see a tiger shark and they're looking in a certain direction. Then they'll turn around and that tiger shark will show up almost as if saying, I got you. Um, and, uh, and these divers, um, uh, the more uh, intrepid ones, will actually rub their noses um, and the tiger sharks go into what's called tonic uh, immobility. Uh, they become quite docile. Obviously you want to be a pro to do that, uh, but they, they, they've got this uh, beauty about them and, and, uh, and importance to the ecosystem that just makes them truly unique. Great, um, so Kat has a question. Is the research that involves pulling sharks out of the water like OSEARCH, which I haven't, it's O-C-E-A-R-C-H, um, is it traumatic for the sharks? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Kat. And um, it's getting a bit controversial the, the tagging of, of these sharks because, um, and, I, and I've talked to uh, scientists who've been involved in tagging sharks over the years. And one in South Africa was very specific and said that uh, after a while, you know, these sharks, you know, they have this tag in there embedded into their dorsal fin. And after a while, it begins to, to drag on them. It can sometimes uh, cause an, an infection um, and really, it, it does stress the sharks. And when we've got too much tagging going on, um, I think in some ways uh, we should pull back on that. Um, we're not maybe getting the kind of bang for our buck in, in some cases doing all this tagging. Uh, we know where they, uh, where they are, where they like to go. They're ma migratory species. And, uh, and, and so I'd, you know, I'd like to actually see less tagging. So. That's a good question, Kat. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, our next question is from Brooke, and she says, my eight-year-old and six-year-old want to know what they can do to help sharks. Uh, well, that, that's a great question, and that uh, warms the cockles of my heart that, they're, that they, they want to help sharks. And I think that, um, again, they can educate themselves as much as they can about sharks, learn about them, uh, read uh, books, whatever that you can. And then when you do talk to people um, and they do bring up things about shark attacks and how dangerous sharks are, you can be a, a shark advocate and you can explain to people uh, the real nature of sharks. They're actually very cautious animals. Uh, they're not crazed animals swimming around uh, looking for us. If they were, it would be a very different picture in terms of a number of attacks. And, and so when you're eight and six, learn as much as you can. So when you get older and you can get involved uh, with organizations and help push legislation, push initiatives through. One of the things I've been working on is, is trying in New York State, for example, to ban shark tournaments. Now there is a bill that is pending in Albany that would uh, make it illegal to have wildlife hunting contests and they're excluding fish, which I think is a mistake. They should include fish. And um, they're not at the moment because the shark tournament people uh, have enough clout to prevent that. But I think the next generation coming up uh, armed with knowledge and information can you know, make sure that right legislation is passed. So uh, when you grow up and get involved, get that legislation passed to stop shark tournaments to put in the right kind of regulation that we need and you can help sharks that way. Mm -hmm. You actually, in your talk last year, shared a story about how there was an island, I wanna say it was in the Philippines, but they were hunting sharks 
and it was really for a living. And when the researchers, whoever went there said, hey, what if we paid you to do something else? And I think they did shark tourism. And so it saved the sharks, it educated people. And then they still had the income because it wasn't, they weren't, you know, hunting sharks wasn't their jam. They just, it was how they made money. Can you yeah. refresh my memory on I, that? I, I do remember, Janet, you have a very good memory. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you bring up uh, a very important issue that uh, you know I didn't have time in the PowerPoint about shark ecotourism. Mm -hmm. And shark ecotourism is really a growing industry. It's gone from virtually nothing uh, 20 years ago. Worldwide, it's $300 million in revenues. Most of that is in the United States, particularly in Florida, $200 million. Uh, I've been on some of these uh, cageless dive uh, operators uh, of Jupiter Inlet, for example. Remember, we went out and jumped over the side, no cage, and some bull sharks showed up. It was a great experience. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, uh, doing that. Um, so anyway, getting back to, uh, to Indonesia. So what the government decided to do was to say to these fishermen, and I, and I, so I feel somewhat for these uh, local fishermen in Indonesia, they're you know, it's very poor countries, they're trying to make a living, uh, and they know they can make money finning sharks. Well, the government gave them an alternative, which was if you take tourists out to the reef and let them go snorkeling, let them go scuba diving, we'll pay you to do that. So you're making money. Uh, the sharks are still alive. And, and it's a great, great concept. And um, I think we're going to see that expand around the world. And, and the forecast is for shark ecotourism to more than double over the next uh, five years. And uh, so, you know, the... You know, a dead shark um, for its fins is worth maybe $150. I think I mentioned that last year. Yeah. Um, the lifetime value of a shark, uh, I've seen numbers of $300,000, National Geographic did, to to a million dollars for some of these sharks that live for decades. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, shark ecotourism is is great. And, um, and I think take advantage of it if you ever come across one. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a couple more questions. This is from Finn. Um, what foundations and or organizations do you suggest someone should donate to? Okay, so um, good question, Finn. And, um, and I think the uh, Oceana has done uh, a lot of very good work trying to get regulations passed to stop finning. Uh, Greenpeace is, is one that also I think does a lot. I happen to have a, uh, a nonprofit called Safeguard the Seas. And if you go to safeguardtheseas.org, um, I'm involved in, again, making resolutions. And I also have a uh, program I just started. It's a book donation program. And the goal is to give my paperback to decision makers. So for example, the American Bar Association, I want to see them get the book so that they can read and understand this. And when I talk to these lawyers, uh, they're very bright people, but they have no idea about longline fishing and the evils uh, that are in it. They have no idea of slavery taking place in the high seas. So I'm trying to get the book out there. So, um, so if you wanna help me with uh, education and donating books to students, schools, uh, that's an option. Um, so there, there are lots of places out there that, that you can contribute and, and that, that's great of you to consider. Okay, we have one more. Um, so go ahead and send in your answers. We're wrapping up, but here's one question from Debbie. Are there impacts to sharks from the opening up of the Northeast Canyons and the Seamount, uh, Seamount's National Monument to commercial fishing? Um, yes, and, and again, an, an another very good question. And uh, I think anytime we open up these areas uh, to fishing, um, they're going to catch sharks. So that, that is uh, a negative. Um, and, and, and I think, again, it gets back to this point that we need to set up these marine protected areas where there's no fishing at all. And it actually helps because the, the fish and the sharks that are in those areas, uh, they, they breed and then they actually go outside the marine protected area where they can be caught and caught sustainably because there's enough of them that, that, that are re reproducing. Um, you know, and, I, and I think we've got to look at uh, closing off areas. Um, and a quick example is right off of Boston Harbor. Uh, a lot of whales were being killed by uh, ship strikes in the steel wagon uh, underwater cor uh, corridor there. 
And so they had the ships reroute themselves so they have less uh, uh, boat strikes and killing whales. Now, that's a little more money to, to pay for the gas to go a little bit out of their way. Uh, but that, that's the kind of mentality that, that we need. And we should do the same thing uh, with, with sharks and, and preserve these areas. And uh, what I'm concerned about uh, longer term is really two issues. And I'll talk about this very quickly. Uh, one is that uh, uh, mining companies realize they need a lot more materials for electric cars, electric batteries. And these nodules are sitting at the bottom of the ocean uh, 4,000, 6,000 feet deep. So they're going to start deep sea mining. Now, when they do that, that disrupts the, the sediment, creates problems. And we need to make sure that that's, the regulations are in place. So stay tuned on, on that one. We're going to see a lot more about uh, deep sea mining. And, and, and I think also that, again, we, we need to, uh, to get involved with changing the regulations, uh, out, particularly outside of this country, uh, to make the concept that you know we're all we all own the ocean. No one country like China can decimate certain species for for at their whim. Yeah. Okay. Any um, final questions? I don't see any. So um, thank you so much, Bill. This was great. It was so nice to see you again. And um, once again, the link to um, his book is in the chat, and I also typed in Safeguard the Seas, right? Is that the nonprofit? Safeguardtheseas.org, yep. Yep, so you can visit that to learn. And then um, williammckeever.com uh, is where you can learn more about him. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and have a great night. Okay, right. thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>